and I welcome you all to the seminar. We will have a good interaction. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Shekhar and Meena and uh, Harish, Dr. Prasad, for the invitation. I'm uh, delighted to uh, be here. This is my first ever visit to any IIM campus. And I was just told that three idiots were shot here. So that suddenly made a tall click in my head. It seems familiar to me to have walking through the campus. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here and uh, the chance to uh, uh, share some of my ideas. Um, where have you guys uh, seen this quote? Zen and Art. Zen and Art, more set of maintenance. So how many of you have read this book? Anyone? Well, one of the best uh, introductions that I've ever read to the whole concept of what quality is. So I'm pretty sure that in your uh, management classes, quality comes up all the time. Is that right? Do you even have like entire courses dedicated to quality management or total quality management and PQM and Six Sigma and all that stuff? So I'm sure as management people, quality is something you're thinking about every day in, in whatever area of work you're focusing on. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking along the same lines, but focusing on tuberculosis and healthcare as a whole. So let me begin with a very quick poll. How many of you have sought medical care for any problem? 100%? Yeah. All right, me too. Okay. How many of you or your family member have had a bad experience that you somehow perceived that you weren't managed rightly or there was some complication or you were not happy with the quality of advice that you got? Okay. How many of you have had a good experience that you feel, oh, not bad, I got a good Good deal. Okay. And I guess you know the opinions in this room effectively capture the crux of the problem. Quality of healthcare and medical care in India is phenomenally variable. You can get the best, most spectacular care, which is no different from the best standard anywhere in the world, to really, really bad care. Right? Effectively it should be criminal malpractice. Okay, so you can span the entire spectrum and, and have all sorts of shades in between. So the question here is, all of you are quite quick to point out, yes, I had a good experience, yes, I had a bad experience. So in general, the question that I'm trying to ask is, how do you exactly judge the quality of healthcare that you're likely to get? In other words, how do you make a decision that today I'm going to go see Dr. X or Clinic Y or Hospital Z? How do you know? before you get there, or when you're making up of your mind that I'm going to go to seek care here or there, how do you know or judge what quality you're likely to get out of that encounter? How do you make decisions? Your references from your... Uh, Word of mouth, references from, from your friends, okay, what else? How else do you judge quality? Brand. Okay. Oh, brand, okay. The hospital brand, okay, all right. So it's a polo, a focus, <coughs> or whatever, all right, what else? Cost. So the more you shell out money, the more you think it's better quality. Right. So how much is your credit card being worked out is an index of quality. Okay, what else? How else do you judge quality of medical? Qualification of the doctor is out there. Qualification of the doctor and very good. Okay. How else do you judge quality? The number of uh, years of experience for the seniority. Okay. So this is fantastic because, you know, when I can come back to this whole idea in the last slide, many of the things that I've had in my mind, you're articulating as well. So, but I'm going to point out some of the big problems in everything that we've just said, okay? So what you shared with me is a perfectly good starting point. And I am not, uh, I, I'm not a person who has all the answers, but I do, will raise some really important and frankly some troubling questions, okay? Which affects every one of us in this room including me. So just to illustrate that I am no different from you are as a consumer of healthcare. This is my kid, my daughter, okay? Four days ago in Allahabad, she got bitten by something, okay? On, uh, just under her uh, eyelid. So you can see her uh, eyes puffed up here. So what does my wife do? Like a good mother, takes her to an ophthalmologist, private doctor. Walks away with a diagnosis of insect bite, unknown insect, okay? Five drugs were prescribed for this four-year-old child, okay? Three antibiotics, an oral antibiotic, one inside the eyes, and one on the skin. And an anti-histaminic and an anti-inflammatory with a total bill that exceeded 2,000 rupees. Okay, now, 
just without knowing anything about the problem. You may already start wondering, is there really quality care? Does this child need five drugs for an uh, uh, insect bite on her uh, face? What exactly goes into deciding whether this encounter was worth it or not? Was it worth the 2,000 rupees I spent? Now, to be honest, 2,000 rupees is nothing for me, okay? But for a, for a family whose entire monthly household income may be 2,000 or less, this is a killer. Do you agree? And poor patients in this country, the ones at the bottom of the uh, poverty line, are accessing private medical care like what I just showed you. Okay? So for them, this amount of expense of buying five antibiotics is not a trivial expense. There are families that go bankrupt in this country or go into serious debt because of medical care. So it's not a trivial issue. It is one that has serious consequences for a lot of people. So when, when I just give you this as a very simple example that happened three days ago, I'm saying it could be much worse. Right? Let's say I have serious chest pain and I'm taken into one of these private hospitals here. What guarantee do I have that I am being managed well, that the right interventions are done for me, that nobody is putting in a stent just to take money out of my wallet. I need to know all this. Right? So do you. Every one of us is a consumer of healthcare. There's nobody who's exempt. Okay? Not one person can claim that this is not my problem. And I'm, I'm raising this to illustrate that it's not easy to judge what quality is. Just giving you an example here to just keep things off. Here's a real story. Okay? How will you know? She's fine. <laughs> she's fine, but you, you know you can understand that that if she wasn't fine, then even all that expense wouldn't have amounted to much. But she may have recovered on her own without any of this stuff. Okay, that's that's also an issue. So here is a real patient. For the uh, I'll just use a fictitious name and a fictitious picture. A 25 year old male from Chhattisgarh state in India, cough and fever for a number of months and weight loss. Now when you see somebody coughing for a long time and has lost weight. Tuberculosis is something that anyone should be able to say that this is a something that I need to worry about. Okay? Goes to a private clinic, as a lot of people in this country do. Okay? What fraction of care in this country do you think is in the private sector? How many people, how many of you go to a public hospital if you call say government hospital? Nobody. <laughs> so what fraction of care in this room goes to private sector? Hundred percent, right? As a whole for the country, it can be as high as 60 to 80 percent. Okay? Even among poor patients, many of them do seek private care to begin with. It's only when they cannot afford it anymore, they've totally run out of all their resources, they fall back on, on public uh, health care system. So he goes to a private uh, clinic, and the doctor there orders a TB antibody test. Okay? It's a simple little test done at a lab. You see, you see the lab report here. That's the antibody test. The antibody test was negative. So he got sent home with some iron tablets and some uh, vitamins and some cough syrup. Okay? Firstly, take a look at the prescription. Okay? That's no prescription. That's just a scrap of paper. Do you take a guess as to what fraction of uh, um, medical providers in this country have any kind of medical records that they may Take a guess. Huh? In the private primary care uh, sector, it's close to zero. So, if you, when was the last time you went to a GP and he took out a big folder on you and said, Oh, last year I treated you for cold, this month you came back for diarrhea, you have this, you have that. Maintaining medical records is just not done. There are hospitals and super specialty hospitals in the country which maintains no records at all. Okay? So then it makes you wonder, how do they know what they did to you last week? If you are lucky and if you are smart, you will carry the prescription back to the doctor and say, hey, this is what you gave last week, it's not working. That's what you do. So they themselves have no records. So if you have lost your little scrap of paper, then they don't even after them know what they diagnosed on you. Right? They don't make a commitment and say, this is what I'm treating you for. They just give you a prescription. That's how most primary care in this country works. So this is no different from that. Now what's the problem with this? Okay. First of all, this test has just been banned by WHO as being completely useless, of no consequence, totally worthless. Okay. This test shouldn't even be on the market. It is on the market. It 
shouldn't be used. No guideline has ever recommended these texts. Should have never been used. It is being used on this man. And guess what? He actually has significant tuberculosis. Pretty severe because his lung is full of uh, TB bacteria. And you do a sputum smear several weeks later. He was found to have advanced TB disease. Within a matter of a few weeks, he died. 25 year old man in the prime of his life lost to a disease which is 100% cure if only managed correctly. What about the skin test? Is it good that? Skin test is useless for active pulmonary okay. So, in all like, so, so it's a totally preventable death, and this is not unique. Most TB deaths in this country happen in the most productive adult age. Not the very young, not the very old, people in the middle age who are out there productive. And the total economic burden on the country has been estimated to be about $3 billion. That's how much money India loses to this disease because of all the young people out there were dying when they should. So this guy had at least 50 years of life, or it's not 40 years of life, it's not 30 years more life of contribution that he could have made, but he didn't. But what's also interesting is because of the way he was mismanaged, he, in all likelihood, infected several others in his community. Right? TB spreads by how? Coughing, right? So when you are in the same bus as me and I have TB and I'm coughing, the bacteria are in the air and then you inhale, right? So he's infected definitely his own family members. But also people in the other groups, community groups that he goes in, maybe his work co-workers, maybe he shared a room with some other friend, who knows? But in any in a crowded environment, transmission happens. So the best guesstimate of this right now is about 15 people infected for each person who has TB and who has uh, bacteria in the sputum. Okay? So now, you can imagine that not only has this guy lost his life, which is bad enough, but he's infected several people in the community. So mismanagement is not only bad for the person, but it's bad for public health. Okay? Because a, an untreated person spreads the infection to several other people in the community. And that to us is really critical because that is where the global TB control program has run into a big roadblock. Despite doing everything we can to control TB, TB is just not going down globally as fast as we would like it to. And this paper, published in Science, basically concludes that TB control programs would be less effective than expected in cutting transmission, mainly because patients are not diagnosed and cured quickly enough. By the time somebody is picked up to have TB, it's already several weeks. And this young man, despite him being coughing for a long time, just didn't get picked up early enough to be put on therapy. Okay? And that's exactly what we see. The average delay between developing symptoms of TB and actually diagnosed can be as long as two to three months. Okay? Two to three months is a long time you can infect several people in that time window. And overall, only about 60% of all TB globally is correctly diagnosed and managed, which means there are people in India who are walking around with TB, coughing, but not picked up, not treated. Okay? And because of all of this put together, and look at the number of doctors people see, or providers people see before they sometimes get diagnosed. They do what's called as doctor shopping. You know, They go to one person, and they don't get better. They go to another per person, then they go to another person. Eventually, they get diagnosed and, and put on treatment. But each doctor, on average, adds about 12 days of delay. Right? When I say doctor, I don't necessarily mean MBBS doctors. There are a lot of practitioners in this country, many of whom have no medical qualification at all. Okay? They're there, they're practicing, they're in the community, they often are the ones that they can go to first. Eventually, they may go to the public hospital, then they may get diagnosed. So this is really important in terms of how many people are, are seen by TB patient, patients, why so much diagnostic delay happens. So globally we have more than 9 million TB cases and about uh, uh, 2 million uh, deaths that happen every year. And interestingly enough, despite all the work done so far, the TB incidence is hardly coming down. It's just barely declining at the rate of 1%. Nowhere as much as we all expected to do, despite several years of intensive work. And India is a spectacular case study of how you can do everything right, but still not solve the problem. Right? Some years ago, India started this revised national tuberculosis control program, which by all counts is a successful program. Okay? 
whatever targets were given to them were met by the government. Okay? They were told you should pick up at least 70% of all TB cases. They have done it. Okay? They were told at least 85% of all TB cases should be correctly treated, fully treated. They have done it. Okay? 100% of the Indian population is covered by this DOTS program. Okay? This TB program has spread, it has been successfully scaled up across India, and now 100% of the Indian population is covered by the program. Technically, any TB patient in this country should get free TB treatment for six months. Whether they can pay or not pay doesn't matter. Technically, that's been done. Okay? Yet, despite meeting all of these, we have still 2 million cases of TB every year. It's been like that for a long, long time. So you've done everything right. Year after year, there are 2 million cases of TB every year. And a large number of people die of TB every year. And I already told you, the economic loss is about $3 billion per year. Because of young, productive people whose uh, work is disrupted or they just die. So this is the problem, even after doing everything right, makes you wonder what exactly is going on, why is it that we can't control the disease that is so ancient, right? TB is centuries old and it's been in India for the longest time. It's not a, a you know a mysterious disease that can't be managed. It is a curable disease. Six months of treatment is enough to cure it, but it's still not able to control the problem in the country. Okay? And there are many, many challenges, right? There's, for just for diagnosis alone, there are so many challenges. The regulatory system is weak. Quality assurance in labs is very poor, and I'm going to come back to this in a while. There's widespread abuse of useless diagnostics, which I already gave you one example of, which shouldn't be used or being used. And there are systematic market failures throughout the value chain. We have a massive private sector in India that is totally not interested in TB control. They just don't want to partner with the government. They just want to do things on their own. And it's okay that they are on their own, but they do all sorts of irrational practices. And that's exactly what I'm going to cover in the next few slides. So there are there are worrisome aspects of the whole diagnostic process. Okay? Ideally, a doctor should order a test, correct test should be ordered, patient should get it done, lab should do it well, the report should be reported back to the doctor, and then that should improve the doctor, patient's outcomes. Okay? That is the ideal cycle of diagnosis, but every inch of this part, process is problematic in India. We have reams of data and research evidence to show that this is a problem. Okay? Simone and I uh, recently uh, wrote a paper on why these useless tests are so popular in the country. And it's going to be published very soon. But one of the key things, and I don't mean, mean for you to read all this text, but I just wanted to highlight for you that one of the key underlying issues that we identified in this paper is the overall lack of regulation of quality in the private sector in India. Not just private, just private and public sector in India. Just lack of quality assurance and how that impacts tuberculosis control. So it's not just diagnosis. Even TB treatment is problematic. Okay? About 20 years ago, Mukundu Plekar uh, from Bombay, who's a private, private doctor uh, who is now at WHO in Geneva, published a very, very interesting paper. He went to the slums of Dharavi. Okay? You guys know about Dharavi slum in Bombay. So he went and met a large number of Doctors. When I say doctors, they're not necessarily MBBS. They could be any kind of doctor. He interviewed 100 doctors, practitioners. Between them, they prescribed 80 different treatments for TB. Can you believe? There's only one treatment for TB. Okay? There's just one treatment for TB. But 100 doctors prescribed 80 different TB treatments. Total, complete lack of any standardization across doctors. Okay. Clearly, all prescriptions cannot be right. There's only one correct prescription for TB. Okay. Now, in 2010, uh, one of my students, uh, who's currently at uh, my student, Lance, he went back to the same Dharavi slum and repeated the study all over again. This time, 106 doctors were found to be prescribing 63 different drug regimens for TB after 20 years. So you don't know if it's getting better or if it's getting worse, but it's still as chaotic as it was even 20 years ago. Okay? So TB treatment is equally problematic in India. Mismanagement of TB in India is, a, is an entire paper that we've written to understand why is it that TB is just not managed correctly. Okay? And I'll give you an example. 
um, Global Alliance for TB Drug Development recently did a market, market study on use of TB drugs in India. Now, I don't know if you guys know, I'm sure you all know. When was the last time when you went to a pharmacy in your, in your wherever you are living or wherever you're working, and you said, give me this drug, and the guy said, I will not give it to you without a prescription. So you can buy pretty much any drug you want in India, correct? With no prescription. So, and the only exception I've heard, the only exception I've ever heard is a drug for influenza called Tamiflu. They talk about Tamiflu when the avian flu came. That was the only antibiotic that you could not just pick off the market, okay? Everything else is freely available. So all TB drugs are freely available over the counter with zero prescription. And this goes to a more wider phenomenon that I'll talk about, discuss later on antibiotic abuse in India. Okay, that's a topic that every one of you is familiar with. All of you have dosed yourself with antibiotics, correct? Yes. With, without prescription, with, without meeting a doctor, you've all played the doctor, you've all dosed yourself, and you all hope like hell that you've not contributed to drug resistance, okay? But that's the, that's the problem. So the total amount of drugs sold in India is far in excess of the actual number of TB cases in India. What do you make of that? The total amount of drugs sold in the Indian market is far in excess of the actual estimated number of cases of TB in India. Which means there's a lot of over-treatment going on. There's so a lot of antibiotic abuse and over-treatment going on. And I'm sure it's not unique to TB. Do you all agree? It's not unique to TB. You take any antibiotic, there's heck of a lot of... I told you, my child got three antibiotics for an insect bite. Okay? There's just a simple illustration how much of antibiotic abuse happens in this country. Okay? And that's exactly what we find. So, the, the, these TB drugs, by the way, are meant to be regulated. They are called Schedule H. You look on the, on the, on the tablets, it will say Schedule H. Okay? Schedule H means you cannot just dispense it over the counter. The regulation is there but nobody is enforcing it, right? Nobody is going and checking which pharmacist is giving drugs with or without a prescription. There's just no enforcement capacity. I mean, you, you talk to the Drug Controller General of India, he'll say, we hardly have any staff. Do you want us to go around looking at thousands of pharmacies? It's impossible, right? So they've all given up. They all say, yeah, sure, every drug is over the counter. There's just really no way of checking. Do you know pharmacists play the doctor and they directly treat patients? So effectively, they are running their own medical practice. Right? So patients directly go to the pharmacy bypassing all doctors because they think that if they first went to a doctor, they have to shell out some money. They might as well go directly to the pharmacist. Right? So it's that kind of an economic uh, approach to, to uh, getting diseases managed. Really scary. And this is just a symbol. Some, some so basically what I've done here is to say, uh, begin with patients with TB symptom. Of them, not all get correctly investigated. Of those who get investigated, only some proportion get the correct TB test. And of those who get the, only some get correct quality assured results. And some get diagnosed, some get TB therapy, some get the correct TB therapy <coughs> in complete six months. Okay? I'm not showing this to scale. I honestly don't know what fraction of all TB patients in India are correctly diagnosed, correctly managed, and complete six months of correct treatment. But I have a bad feeling it's a small number. Okay? Which means all of these people at every level are spreading disease to other people. Which can explain why we still have 2 million cases every year despite seemingly doing everything right. Okay? So this is, this is a very worrisome impact of TB mismanagement. So now, for this year, 2012, the National TB Control Program has set a new goal. The new goal is universal access. They're saying every TB patient in the country, in principle, should get correctly diagnosed and treated correctly. Right? Now you can imagine universal diagnosis in India means you have to deal with the private sector. You cannot work in India and claim to say you can reach everybody without dealing with this mega private sector. I already told you, 60 to 80 percent of all medical care in India is in private hands. Okay? So if you don't deal with this elephant, private sector, and get them to practice correctly, 
with high quality, there's no way on earth you control NTP. Okay? That's one of the biggest challenges. How do you manage the private sector, which is frankly very, very important? So I see private sector both ways. I see it as part of the problem. Clearly, they're doing things which are totally <coughs> irrational and shouldn't be done. At the same time, they're part of the solution. You cannot control any decision in this country or anything in this country for that matter if you don't engage the private sector. The private is a very, very key player. They have to partner it. Government can't do it alone. Private cannot do it alone. It has to be a, a, a partnership. And that partnership right now is virtually non-existent. Public does what it wants to do. Private is on its own. These two parties are not meeting, not talking, not working together. Okay? How to bring these two groups together has just baffled everybody. I have been no ideas in the TV world. We have tried all sorts of tricks, nothing has worked. We have no clue on how to go about doing this. This is partly why sometimes I feel business people like you would have a better insight on how to make these two work. Have you heard of public private partnerships? Right? And surely they have worked in some areas. Right? Uh, can you give me examples of public private partnerships that have worked in any area? Railways? Is railways a good example? No, isn't railways held up like Lalu Yadav's work, held up as an example of how he made the government sector profitable, but also private sector was heavily involved in that? Is that not true? Is that not a case study for you? No. Indian railways? That I heard Lalu goes around giving talks at Harvard Business School yeah, and all that. We shouldn't call the private sector too much. Okay. So there's no, but there's infrastructure in Rome. Infrastructure and highways. So there are clearly some examples that have worked well. There are some that have not worked well. TV is an example of what PPM has not worked well. But I think innovative business models that allow the private sector to do, make their money, do whatever they need to do, be viable, and yet do public good. Is a, is a way of thinking about it. And that's what these social entrepreneurs, social in a, social business innovative models, where you're trying to be innovative, you want to be financially viable, yet there's a social purpose behind all of that. I think those are all interesting ways to think about it. So private sector is absolutely critical, yet it hardly contributes anything to the National TV Control Program. Private doctors hardly say to their patients, here, you're too poor, you have TV, go to this public, TV program, you will get absolute free treatment. They don't do that. Can you guess why, why they don't do that? Yes. Yes. Incentives, right? So they, they want to keep their patient, even if the patient is going broke and can't afford to buy TV medicines off the market. Okay? So this whole system has got so many, uh, and, and it really is so important that if we don't incentivize and get the private sector working with us, there's no hope and hell of controlling TV in India. So I wanted to pose two big challenges for TV control in India. To be honest, I have no answers. Nobody in the TV sector here has any answers. Okay? And the two questions are, how do we engage India's massive private sector to work with the public government TV control program to expand the reach of the program? So that every person in India who has TV gets free quality assured treatment. And how do we get private providers, even if they don't want to engage with the government, fine, let them not engage with the government. But let them at least do a good job, quality job of managing TV. Use the right test, do it at the right time, use the right treatment, make sure your patient completes six months of treatment so that they're not spreading infection to anyone else. Okay? How do we get the private providers to follow national or international guidelines and offer good quality TV care? Nobody has the faintest clue on how to crack these two problems. They've tried all sorts of experiments. Nothing has ever worked. Okay? It's one of the biggest challenges. We just don't know how to go about doing this. In part because I don't think any of the approaches we've done until today have really been market-based. To really understand what gets a private doctor excited, what are the incentives that make him or her align their practices and do the right thing? Right? What are the business models to really succeed in this market-driven place. So what I'm actually thinking about today, honestly, is that TV, I see, all the issues that I've spoken about TV are merely a symptom. It's a symptom of a much bigger underlying disease. And that underlying disease is epitomized by just some of these problems that I'm listing here. It's just a <coughs> tiny list of everything that is wrong, that is going on. Okay? 
Have you guys heard of unnecessary cesarean sections? Yes. Have any of you had uh, uh, heard of stories like that? Have you heard of hospitals where pretty much every woman gets a cesarean section? Yes. yes. Have you heard of widespread antibiotic abuse? Polypharmacy, too many drugs, unnecessary injections. Do you guys know how many uh, rural practitioners gave intravenous fluids? Have you, have you heard of this uh, rural, um, what are they called? Markets, uh, weekly markets, like what are they called? Shanti. 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 So on that market day, these guys will all go line up there. People will come, poor patients who are sick. And they'll just put up an IV tube on the tree and just give intravenous infusion. Not even qualified to do any of that. Okay? Very common. Have you heard of the unnecessary steroid injections? Absolutely. Kickbacks. Do you guys know what fraction of the money goes back for every CT scan or MRI that I order? Take a guess. 10%? 40%. You can't survive in the market if you just give 10% back. It's as high as 40%. Okay? Sometimes as high as 50%. Do you know of master health checkups? Which have, which, are, which have totally unnecessary tests in them that have no rationale. And then if something is positive, then you need to get an intervention after that, an angiogram and this and that. Right? And, and of course, a very well-known nexus between doctor and the pharma industry in India. Is any of this shocking or surprising? No. No? So I'm not scaring you in any way. You're not, you know, you're not about to run to the door, right? Because these are just merely symptoms. In other words, Everything I've said about TB is not unique to TB. It's a much, much wider problem than TB, and it is just symbolized by everything that I've just given to you as vignettes. And I can give you many, many more. About, um, I don't know, 14 years ago, I did a study myself in Chennai City, in a middle class uh, area of Chennai City, where I went house to house, and I spoke to moms who delivered a baby. And I just asked the mom, so what was your birth? Was it a normal delivery or was it a C-section? Guess what fraction of the moms told me it was a C-section? 20 is about 50%. Now, what's what's right or what's wrong with that number? 50% of deliveries being C-section. So you don't need that. And so how much do you think is an acceptable number? So, this is not a fair question to ask you because it really requires medical knowledge. But most doctors, obstetricians will agree that the expected cesarean section rate in any population is about 15%. Okay? 10 to 15% at best. Okay? So if it's 50%, there clearly cannot be medical reasons for that many cesarean sections. So if it's not a medical reason, what reason is it? Reputation, financial, whatever. Demand from our moms, sure, what else? There are hospitals, and I will not, I cannot name them for obvious reasons, where the, there's pretty much every mom almost must get a C-section. It's like 100% C-section rates in some private hospitals in the country. In fact, somebody jokingly told me, I don't know if it was a joke or not, I believe one day, a mom just was rushed in and they had to do a normal delivery because it was too late to do a C-section. And they didn't even know how to handle the normal delivery. Because everybody had lost expertise in doing a normal delivery. Okay, It's a tongue-in-cheek way of saying that it's just completely insane. You cannot have a hospital with 100% C-section day. People nowadays go to expensive hospitals. Right. When you know, we, places where you know it's normal delivery. But the normal delivery is more expensive than the C-section. Oh, I see. Okay. So, it's interesting. So, they are basically saying, I want a normal delivery. I'm willing to pay more for it. Yes. Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that perverse? Like, that's just nuts. They can not have a situation where that's the case, right? So, this is just a mere example. So, I wrote that up. I published it in Economically Politically Weekly. And no, no obstetrician wanted to talk to me after that, okay? After I published this paper. And since then, others have confirmed exactly what I, what I had found in India. Very, very high rates of C-section. The other problem that people talk about is, you cannot be over the age of a woman, over the age of 40, 50 in, 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 in this country, and still have a uterus. For any little thing, you go to an obstetrician, let's do a hysterectomy. End of the problem, all solved, everybody's happy, I'm also making money. Patients are also happy. 
It's crazy stuff. It's the rare obstetrician who say, no, 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 it's fine, you really don't need a hysterectomy. Okay? It's the rare obstetrician or gynecologist who say, you do not need a hysterectomy. Okay? It's just completely insane. I mean, you cannot explain this. There can be no medical rationale for this sort of overuse of surgical intervention. Okay? And here's another example. This is something that Simone uh, has thought a lot about as well. Uh, this is this published this year in Times of India. The doctor's cut adds to your medical bill, right? The whole cut practice or incentives, right? I refer to you, you give a cut back to me. You refer to me, I give a cut back to you. It is so common that everybody has already factored this into their business model. Okay? No, you cannot run a CT scan or an MRI uh, scan center in this country without factoring in what fraction needs to go back to the referring doctor. Okay? That's why when a patient pays an MRI bill, or a, have any of you had a scan done for anything? What's the average price? CT or MRI? 3,000. 3, okay? The actual cost of CT cannot be that much. It's already factored in. 3,000 some 10 years ago, in 2018, it was 3,000. Technology has definitely improved. Has to have come out. It, it, it cannot be that. So in other words, everybody who is paying a diagnostic bill is paying the bill for the test plus the kickback. Okay, that's how it's factored in. They even have software which will allow them to plug in and someone showed me the, the image. The, they have X-ray radiology software where the reference fee or cutback is already programmed into the software. So they keep a tab on who needs to get how much at the end of the month. Okay? Then it's all done in a very smooth, efficient way. Uh, clearly, I don't think any, any of it is taxed or anything like that. It's all nice, smooth economy. It's working perfectly fine. And it's part of the bill. So all of us are paid. Okay? It's not something that you're not. I, I'm, I'm no exception. If I go get a CT scan, I'm paying for it. Okay? All right. And intervention and procedures are a huge driver of cost in India. Every one of you have heard this from your family or who have had this ex experience yourself. The minute you go for a test or a procedure, the bills start, start skyrocketing. Right? How often have you heard of somebody with chest pain? You have a chest pain, if you go to a cardiac surgeon, the likelihood of you getting a bypass surgery is nearly 100%. <coughs> <laughs> you go to the surgeon, what else is he or she going to tell you? Right? you know, of course you need a bypass surgery, right? And then, <laughs> it's, just, uh, it's just simple economics, there's just no mystery or secret to this. Bypass surgery, stents, endoscopy, CTs, MRI, IV fluids, steroid injections are all examples where one, when one's income is based on the number of procedures or interventions or prescriptions or tests, then you can automatically take it for granted that that incentive is going to drive the practice. Okay? There are hospitals where they send you a note every month saying, Doc, you haven't done your quota of MRIs this month. Okay? They're told that you need to meet a certain quota every month for MRIs, for CT scans, for endoscopies and procedures. Okay? Are you all getting worried or you, you look so sad to me? Okay? I, I don't mean to put you off, but this is this is absolutely true. There's nothing that I'm saying that is actually untrue. Okay? So now what do you do with this is the question. So I come back to my question that I began with. How good is quality of medical care in India? And how does one understand and study this? Okay? It has great ramifications. There are people who've done really interesting work in this area. I I've done a little bit, but these guys have really spent a lot of time thinking about what quality really means and how do you study it. I was very interested in a very uh, fascinating, you guys know about this Tehelka? They had an entire issue, if you go to their website, uh, in um, February of this year, and it basically says no place to be sick. Even if you could afford it, a private hospital may be the last place you would want to be. It's like an expose on what really happens in private sector, who gets kicked back, why are cesarean section rates sky high, fascinating uh, piece of work, okay? investigative journalism. So basically, the kinds of stuff that I'm telling you, you will get to read it there as well. Okay, And they, they, they discuss all of those issues. So here are the common problems. The Gates Foundation has spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I'm a consultant for the Gates Foundation. So they shared this information with me. Based on data from across the world, 
they've identified some really common problems in private sector care. Doesn't matter whether you're a private sector in Nigeria or private sector in Pakistan, same sorts of issues that crop up all the time. Number one, financial barriers to use. Private sector care invariably tends to be more expensive for poor patients. And the patients who can afford it least often end up seeking private medical care. Okay? It's a fascinating paradox and one that has been talked about by a lot of people as to why. And why do you guys think poor patients seek private care even though they may know it's expensive? Well, the government is worse. Government is worse? Possibly? Yes, what else? Just to get back to what is the uh, the commerce, uh, I mean, everyday living. So you have to get back to your work as soon as possible. Great point. You don't want to go wait for six hours in a public hospital. Yes. Have you guys ever been to the of Medical Sciences? Yes. Spectacular example. You walk into that place, you say, man, how am I going to ever get out of this place in one piece, okay? It's so crowded. There are people out there who actually park themselves in the, in the lawns of all the days of Medical Sciences for days before they get seen, right? It's unbelievable. You see it in, in times of India, okay? It's that crowded. And the public system can't just deal with it, right? By the way, it's not free. But it's not free either, okay? Secondly, delayed care. I just told you how much delay is added every time somebody mismanages or misdiagnoses TV. One doctor after another. Diagnostic delays are very common. The shopping around multiple private providers is very interesting, well-recognized phenomenon. non adherence to complete treatment regimens. TB is a spectacular story. <clears throat> you take drugs for one week, and then you run out of money, what do you do? You default, okay? In other words, you give up. And if you take drugs like that intermittently, whenever you can afford it, whenever you have a little bit of money, it's guaranteed recipe for drug resistance. The bacteria become resistant, and you actually end up with drug-resistant TB, which is very, very hard to cure. There are some strains of TB reported in India, which are called totally drug-resistant TB. TDR. Okay? That means not a single drug works, which is effectively a death sentence. It's back to the pre-antibiotic era. You guys know what they used to do for TB patients like, you know, 100 years ago? There were no drugs, no antibiotics. What would they do? Sanatoria. You guys know about sanatoria? Effectively, you have fresh air, fresh water, and then you just hope like hell that you would survive. Like that's basically all they had in those days. There was no, there was no uh, antibiotic available, and, and that's a similar situation with this totally drug resistant misdiagnosis. You've already heard me say that excessive use of inappropriate technology. Okay, I've said this already. So these are well recognized. This is not my uh, slide, but this is what everybody knows is a is a common uh, problem. So all health consumers have a very imperfect basis for recognizing quality or value for money. Private providers are independent and motivated largely by self-interest rather than norms or exhortation that we work in public sector organizations. Market incentives offer favor inappropriate care and are extraordinarily powerful. Okay? Market incentives are absolutely critical to understanding <coughs> why is it that some things happen the way they actually happen. Regulation is rarely feasible in countries with underdeveloped governance and administrative structure. I'll come back to this issue of regulation of medical care and, and private care in India. It's a huge uh, issue as far as we are concerned here. Okay? Some macro trends that all of you will be already aware of or can very easily connect with. Tell me if any of these make resonate with you. Growth in household <coughs> incomes. Do you all agree? There's a lot more economic growth. Rising health awareness, greater willingness to pay among the middle and upper classes. We already said people are willing to pay more if they perceive something to be of higher quality. Increasing chronic disease burden with infectious diseases continuing to be a problem. Right? You could have diabetes and chronic disease like heart disease or obesity, and then you could die of dengue or TB or malaria or chikungunya or whatever. Okay? Both coexist in India. Uh, increasing governmental expenditure on healthcare. The current promise is 3% of GDP. Okay? currently being debated in the planning commission, may or may not be that much, but certainly there's a bigger commitment from the government to spend on healthcare. Growth of health insurance. How many of you are aware of health insurance programs, both in public and private sector? So that about 10 years ago, there was virtually no health insurance in this country. Now it's just rocketing upwards, including the public sector. Corporatization of healthcare with a very strong private sector for service delivery. Okay? 
more and more corporate chain hospitals are cropping up all the time. Growth in medical tourism is quite important, very well documented. Emergence of new business model like franchising chains, like the same hospital opens in eight different locations in India, and privatization of medical education. Guess how many private medical schools there are today? Do you know how much people pay to become a doctor? Take a guess. 25 lakhs? 25 lakhs. 25 lakhs. It's in that range now. Okay? And if you want a, a, a master's in surgery, right, post graduation, you're paying that much amount of money. Okay? So now you have to ask yourself when you shell out that much money to become a doctor, how soon do you need to recover the money back? What's the ROI? Right? Return on investment. Right? Return on investment. And that then clearly links up with corporatization of healthcare that everybody now acknowledges to be a problem. So these are some bigger trends within which we need to understand what the context is. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead. We've also paid a fairly high amount here. We are wondering what the cost is also. What justifies the one crore that uh, new medical students need yeah, to pay? It is, it is not based on any social rationing uh, premise. It's simply a matter of who is willing to pay, right? So long as, so if I am running a private medical school and I say, you want to see one growth, you will willing to shut up. So that becomes my baseline, right? It's not based on any sensible, rational thought process. It's a question of how much can I get out of you. This would again be an illegal price because I'm sure there are uh, rules and regulations to decide the official price. So you know there are always creative ways around rules, right? So that, that's never a deterrent as far as the evidence on Okay. So now I come back to this issue of how do you define quality of health care. Take a this like the yeah. growth of insurance. Yeah. Has that, has that been working for India or has that been detrimental for India? Because once you have insurance, people tend to go to private hospitals who tend to over-prescribe medicines, who tend to over -diagnose. So I'll come back to the uh, insurance issue on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and we'll discuss it at that stage. Okay, so hang on to it, I'll come back to it in a second. It's a very interesting question. So now, how does one define quality of healthcare? So tell me if any of these make sense to me. So you uh, sense to you. So you could always define quality as being is the hospital or clinic clean and neat? Yes? How many of you think that's an index of quality? Okay. Are the necessary equipment and resources available? Yes. Are providers qualified? Does the provider know the right thing? So what is this index? Do they know what the heck they're doing? Right? Okay. Does the provider do the right thing? How do we know? You can't know. You really cannot know. Okay? But there are ways to study that. Right? The, then the next thing is, and, and tell me what the difference is between these two. Provider knows the right thing and provider does the right thing. So could you know the right thing and still not do it? Yes. Okay. So what's that called? <laughs> That's what they're doing. So what's that called? It's a no-do gap, right? They know what they're doing is totally stupid, but they'll still do it because it's economically viable or whatnot. Okay, so that's the issue. And then what is this criteria? A patient's happy with the human interactions. How were you treated? Did somebody talk to you, make you feel happy, right? That is a soft, subjective way of checking quality, right? So when I asked you, have you had a good experience? You probably were in this bracket. You're saying, huh, they, took, they spoke to me well. They could have still done a horrible job, but they spoke to you well, right? That's an index of quality. Lastly, this is like a hard outcome. Are patients getting better? Right? You ask me, is my daughter better, right? So that's one way of saying, look, regardless of what happened, if I survive and if I recover, then that's one index of quality, okay? All of these are various approaches to, some are easier to measure, some are harder to measure. And I have a feeling most patients judge quality in this bracket and maybe in this bracket, right? We visually look and see how the facility is and we may look at the provider's qualification. And then if we are treated nicely, we probably will agree that it was overall a decent quality experience, okay? But that's probably not the only way of looking at quality. And this is the same thing in another slide. You can look at structural issue, building, equipment, drug availability. You can look at delivery issue, responsiveness, for example, waiting time. Would you agree waiting time is an interesting quality indicator? Okay. Now, if you if you break, if you have a minor illness in Canada, if you go to the government health system, 
you could wait like 24 hours before you see. Nobody in their right mind will ever go to an emergency department in these countries for a minor problem. But if you really have a bad problem, you get fantastic care very quickly. Okay? So the wait times are very, very different. Okay? Confidentiality, friendliness, so on and so forth. Effort, length of consultation time, whether a physical examination is performed, number of explanations given. Do they spend time with you, counseling you, that look, you're not going to die, you're going to be fine, but you may have the side effect, or this is what you should expect to have, stuff like that. Okay? Patient satisfaction. And then technical issues, competence. That's where professional knowledge and skill. Now, competence is where I think patients will have a hard time judging. Right? It's not easy for patients to know whether a doctor knows what she or he is supposed to be doing. And then clinical practice. Are the right guidelines followed? And is the prescriptions correct, correctly done? Is, a, is the doctor doing what should be done and avoiding what shouldn't be done? That's a more interesting issue. So stuff like unnecessary interventions would fall here. Okay? Prescribing the wrong treatment will fall here. These are really uh, technical issues that lay people often are challenged. And these are ideally meant to be self-policed. Right? What is an Indian Medical Council doing? That they are the ones who are supposed to be regulating or checking on these sorts of things. Whether they do it or not is a different issue, but that's what self-policing really is. So, these are all various approaches to studying quality. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but for example, you could do a questionnaire, right? You could give the doctor a questionnaire and say, how would you manage a case of malaria? Right? Sure, I'll write something, right? That's a questionnaire base. Direct observation. I could just post it in a clinic, and I look at the encounter as it's being played out. Right? And I make a note of how long you spend with the client, how many questions did you ask, did you check the temperature, did you do the blood pressure, did you check weight, all those sorts of direct observations. Patient satisfaction surveys. Have you ever filled out one of these in any of the hospitals that you've gone to? When was the last time anyone even bothered to ask you if you were satisfied with your medical encounter? Isn't that interesting? So there are a lot of hospitals which don't want to know. Whether you're happy with the care or not. How many hotels have you gone to, restaurants, where they've asked you for your survey at the end? Whether it's a five star or a four star, where you stayed there for two days, do you mind letting us know what your experience is like? Generally, service industries want to know whether their clients are happy or not, right? But medical sector is an interesting source, right? Surgery, nobody who does a surgery should do it without auditing their wound infection rates. You guys know what wound infections are? If you have a surgery done, you have a scar, the wound gets infected, that's a quality index. If the wound infection rate exceeds a certain number, that means there's something crazy going on in the hospital. Either in the theater, in the way the nurses scrub, the way the doctors scrub, or the gloves have holes, who knows what's going on. Somebody's got to check that, right? Everybody has to have audits built in. The most important audit of all is every death in the hospital must be discussed. No matter how old, how sick, every death should be discussed threadbare to say, could this have been prevented? It is a very difficult meeting to attend, okay? And ideally, every discussion should be honest. We goofed up, right? We goofed up, we didn't pick up this infection, the patient died. Why? Because others <coughs> learn from that experience. Any hospital that knows what it's doing should have mortality audits, okay? Now, I'm terrified to even ask, how many hospitals in this country do these sorts of audits? Do you have any ideas? I don't know. I, I work thankfully in hospitals where I, these audits are done every month without any discussion. You're never supposed to miss these audits. Especially if one of your patients died and you don't show up at this audit, it's a bad situation. Okay? And so I know I've worked in such fantastic hospitals, but I've also seen hospitals. I've already told you there are hospitals with no medical records. <coughs> what kind of an audit can you do? You have to have some paper, right? To see who got what, what surgery, what happened, who got infected, what was the temperature, what drugs are they on. If you have zero records, what sort of audits can you do? Quality is impossible to make up, right? To me, not having medical records is the biggest quality index. That tells me this hospital doesn't give a damn, right? It's scary as hell that you don't even have records on every patient that you admitted. Forget outpatients, at least inpatients, right? 
once you are admitted, something should be raised. There should be a chart, there should be a medical record. And there are hospitals. I was blown away. I learned about this last week. They said there are super specialty hospitals in Karnataka, Karnataka, okay, which have zero medical records. Okay? Use of vignettes and case studies. This is fascinating. So here you actually send a pretend <coughs> patient. Okay? So I walk into your clinic, I pretend to be a patient. I say, Doc, so I've been trained to behave in a certain way. And I walk in unannounced. That's why they call incognito or mystery clients. They walk into your clinic and they pretend to be a patient. Now obviously it has to be only for some diseases. You can't act everything, but some diseases are eligible to this. So I could walk in and say, Doc, I have severe crushing pain here that's radiating to my left shoulder. What do you think I'm talking about? Heart attack. You guys know, but I show you a lot of doctors don't know that would be a heart attack. You you know more medicine than some people are practicing in this country. And I'm going to show you data, okay? So then what happens? You you observe what the response is. Does the doctor order? So if it's a heart attack, what do you think the doctor should do? Because you already know a lot. That's why I'm asking you. What? ECG. What do you think that makes sense? Well, guess what fraction of uh, such patients get an ECG? Okay, I'm going to show you data. So in general, this is how you look for. And you can also do what's called as an observe, simulate patient. Okay? So this is, for example, just sitting in the doctor's office and just observing encounters. Okay? That's a nice way of figuring out what's going on. And this is an observed simulated patient. So this mom walks in with the mannequin, the dog, right? And say, she says, obviously, the, the doctor is aware that it's a simulated exercise. But you basically use the dog, <laughs> you hope, right? So basically, you use the dog to say, look, my five-year-old has got very high fever and chills for three days, right? So you then ask, figure out whether the doctor or the pediatrician checks the temperature, whether the doctor or the pediatrician asks some key questions, right? How long has the fever been, right? Does it have chills or not? Do you have cold along with fever or not, right? Because that changes the diagnosis. So then you use the simulated patient to check whether they encounter this high or low quality. And this sort of work, the more you do it, the scarier it gets. So this is based on work done in Delhi. And, and what's scary for me is an average time spent in outpatient care in Delhi is four minutes. Four minutes is the actual average time a clinical interaction takes place. So in four minutes, how much can you do? How many questions can you ask? How many actually required examinations can you complete? Right? So you can see here, it's about four minutes. Three questions on average, only about 60% do any physical examination. You know, auscultating your chest, checking whether your abdomen is okay or not, checking your pulse, checking your temperature, stuff like that. Polypharmacy, total number of medicines given is about three. Three. Three drugs are prescribed on each prescription. Okay? So this is data from Delhi. This is the stuff I told you. So these guys, 327 mystery client walked in with crushing chest pain, okay? And they observed what the doctors or providers actually did. They should have ideally thought about a heart attack and they should have done some things, right? That's the expectation. And here is it. So only 33% were told that they have a heart, heart attack. 13% were told they had a heart attack. They, they, many people were said they had gas. Stomach upset gas. Take uh, Tai Chi or you know, Jerusalem and go home. Okay? And in about 178 out of 327, zero diagnosis can be. They didn't tell the client this is what you have. Half of all people got no diagnosis, and only 13% were correctly identified as having heart attack. This is in India, okay, across several regions of India. But when the patient is not having any disease, what we are expecting the doctor to diagnose? No, no, make the effort to ask for an ECG to check if they have a heart attack is what they have. Yeah. Maybe, maybe good enough to understand that there is no problem with the patient. No, no, no. It's not, no, no. Tell it's it's not, it, it is not something that, that they can... In other words, if, you, if I present with some classic symptoms, we expect them to think or worry about some, some diseases. That's what this is saying, actually. Right? Not really true, but that's what we're hoping them, for them to do. And, and people pay heck of a lot of money for a whole 
bunch of medical intervention. I already told you poly polypharmacy. Look at the number of different drugs. And most patients could have just done with just aspirin perhaps. Okay, aspirin is a useful drug for vagina and heart disease. But they get a lot of different drugs which are prescribed. So this systematic review looked at evidence from all over the world on quality of medical care in low and middle income countries. So by and large, they concluded that quality in both public and private sector seems poor, with private sector performing better in drug availability and aspects of delivery of care, including responsiveness and effort, and possibly being more client oriented. That actually makes a lot of sense to me. Right? Private sector does tend to be a lot more client oriented because they want to keep the keep the clients themselves. So they generally tend to be more responsive. Public sector tends to be, I don't care if you come or not. Right? That's the pretty traditional approach in the private sector. So I'm going to end by asking some uh, questions. So what can improve quality of care in India? Okay? Here are some of the things that I've listed. Regulation, accreditation, quality standards and standardized guidelines, monitoring and evaluation, incentives, consumer or legal action, continuing education and training, insurance and financing models, and demand creation of quality. What do you guys, without knowing what my slides are going to say, which of these do you think would be the best way of getting private or any any practitioner in this country to offer better quality care? Regulation. 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 Penalties could be so penalty could be part of regulation or should be a separate criteria. Like you're saying punitive action. Yeah, punitive action. Okay. But beyond the uh, legal or consumer action? Yes, yes. The same as legal action? Yeah. Because you have separate penalties. Incentives. Incentives. Okay. But what about the number of doctors? I mean, we have to continue educating and training them. Right. Yes, we need to get a yeah, large one million, uh, you know, population country. We need more medical practitioners. So when we have something shortage, what do we generally do? Like onion prices, what do we do? We stop exports. Right. Why can't we stop exports for? Okay, so you you think that quality of care will be enhanced by having more doctors available? See, we have. I'm not debating. I'm just asking you. We have a ton of problems. Like this, I mean, there might be a marginal few number of people or percentage of people who we need, you know, those super specialist kind of things. But the vast majority need primary. primary. Okay. So, so he's saying we need more like general practitioners or family doctors. Okay. But what else? Tell us what the situation is huh? in terms of supply and demand. I mean, right. Generally, going by what is the number of doctors expected and the number of you know per a thousand people. Mm -hmm. What is generally the world average? What is our what I'll, I'll come to the, the, to the practitioners in, in a second. Anything else that you would like me to add? Where would you put the education issue that we discussed about that one curve? The continuing education or the medical education? The medical education. To That's start interesting. Start. So go back to the roots and fix it. That's where you started, right? Are you tell yeah. the person, you Fair tell enough. legally, you continue to be... Fair like, enough. Okay. Medical education. What do you mean by demand creation for quality? How is in other words, if, if the consumer is more quality conscious, then they would somehow sideline the bad quality and then especially. I, I understand that, but basically, medicine is a very complex uh, subject. Mm -hmm. so it is, there's a lot of uh, function, uh, variables in that. There's a trust factor, you need sure. to, uh, there's a fear factor, everything is there. Now, that, that seems to be the most ob obvious thing, but how could a patient know that the doctor is actually goofing up? I That's mean, a great point, and I will definitely come back to this because I was going to ask I'll, you guys what you thought. The provider is the certifier of quality. Yeah. He's saying you're getting better. You're yeah. getting better. Yeah. How do you really know? No, it's a, it's a very fair point. Go ahead. I think the transparency also becomes an issue because we, we spoke about uh, you know di standardized di diagnosis is transparent enough to make sure. I mean, I, 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 have to, I have experience in the United States. They don't take a risk and give all the diagnosis unless yes. because of the legal action. Legal action. So legal sure. action is killing uh, uh, customers over there sure. because the diagnosis diagnosis sure. is standardized sure. and there's a legal action if they don't do it. Sure. But what if you know, if this diagnosis is not required and then again 
you are paying too much, though you are giving an insurance, but you are, you are really not sure what you are paying for it. There's a reputation so of this. It's a great point. So we test just to cover your yourself so in case there's a liability. But, but, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a there's a completely different. I mean, if somebody dies in a hospital, you know, the, 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 the neighbor would go, still go to the same hospital. See, what I'm saying. So something has to be thought because if you if you do legal action. Then, standardized guidelines will definitely follow that, and if that follows, the transparency becomes an issue, which is already an issue. There is a cut and all, right? If you follow something, something will block. So, I think a, there has to be a different prescription altogether, so that we tackle the basic we, problem. We all agree that it's complicated a problem to fix. But I'm just listing at this stage, and we'll discuss some of these in a bit, a bit more detail. Go ahead. If, if somebody did this, okay. So let me just share some more, some few parts on this. In terms of regulation. You guys, so basically, private medical sector in India is completely unregulated, okay? You can do pretty much anything you want in private sector. You can, you can practice with no degrees, okay? You can start a hospital tomorrow morning in your backyard with no requirements for registration, certification, nothing. Anybody can start a lab. Anybody can practice anything in this country. Okay? It is 100% unregulated. And for the longest time, nobody knew what to do about this. Okay? Finally, after decades of work, okay, I'm not kidding you, people have worked on this for more than a decade. Finally, the Clinical Establishments and Regulation Bill was passed by the House of Parliament in 2010, last year. Okay? So it has been passed, finally. And now, guess what? No, no doctor wants to see this act actually enacted. Okay, doctors are completely and totally against this act. They do not want to see it enforced. They do not want to see it implemented. Indian Medical uh, Medical Association is a powerful body. It's a lobby, right? IMA completely does not want this clinical establishment act to be enforced. Who are the NCI people? No. Medical Council. Medical Council of India is part of the government, right? So but it's, the, it's the private establishment which just does not want any regulation to be enforced. So it's there on paper. It's even been passed in the parliament. But it has very little chance of seeing the light of the day because all the lobbies have effectively blocked this. So then I had a related question. Like if you suspect a doctor you know, of having been uh, not careful during all this, so, uh, are you in a position, um, does the law even permit you to proceed against them? Uh, There's certainly a consumer and, uh, law. No, no, but from what course. I know, they have, they enjoy certain immunity which is not so in other countries. So, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. I, I'm not a medical legal expert okay. and I certainly haven't been practicing here in a while, so I cannot give you deeper insights. But yes, there are, there are people. So, is it worse off in India is what I meant? I mean, I'm guessing it's worse off in India. Consumer advocacy and activism is still it's not that. It's general court in India. It's general. The, the problem with India, as you know, you take something to court, they act on it three years later. It's just insane. I mean, you can't get any any legal recourse even in high-profile murder trials, right? Let alone, you know, some doctor doing something. So it's a matter of whether anyone is interested and has the you know, money and the and the perseverance to go through a long run of legal hassle in this country. Suppose there is a system in which basically we can maintain records. Yeah. Would the uh, I mean the situation in India? Would the insurance sector or the lawyers pay for that kind of uh, they pay for that kind of system if we can maintain health records? Say for example, there is a technology that can. Ideally, happen. the basic. That's correct. Basic so, work. Yeah, that's correct. But basically, if if somebody does it, we'll figure out how. I think we'll figure out how how it can be done. But if somebody does it, yeah, will lawyers pay for it in India no. to sue hospitals? But we know that, that the consumers are willing to pay, so they'll bear the brunt. They'll pass on the bill. Pay. I'm saying you anyway pay. I mean, it's, I, I I clearly don't have answers. But basically, this is their way out of the regulation. So as of today, I can tell you that it is 100% unregulated. Nobody knows how to regulate private medical sector in India. Any efforts that have been made, including this mammoth effort, which has taken more than a decade, are still not being enacted. Okay? So this is the idea. Now let's talk about the next issue, accreditation. So you guys know 
know about accreditation, right? So in your field, what are, is it ISO 9000? What are the quality management systems, right? What is Six Sigma? Is that also a quality certification? So quality and quality accreditation and certification is a big deal part of your world, right? Any company that is worth its name will get a bunch of those quality certificates and display it proudly. Take a guess at how many hospitals and labs in this country are dying to get some kind of accreditation. Okay. So I uh, last week I met the CEO of the National Quality Council, which runs NABH and NAL. NAB, NABH is National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers. Only 130 hospitals across all of India have been accredited, of which only 10 are public. So vast majority of hospitals in India have no accreditation. So you cannot use, so you cannot look at two hospitals and say, okay, I'll, I'll go to this one because it's NABH or it's accredited and I, don't, I won't go to this one because it's not, okay? Labs is even worse. Less than 250 or 50,000 plus labs have any kind of accreditation. So if, in effect, most establishments in India have no quality certification of any sort. Increasingly, I believe, they're getting ISO. Do you guys know about the ISO process? Have you ever been involved in any quality uh, ISO certification? <coughs> it really does not certify the clinical quality. It basically says you have all the papers in order. Correct? So, I'm presuming a lot more people will get ISO 9000 and keep it. But I would I would hesitate to equate that with quality. Is that, is that right? Is that uh, making any sense? So then, accreditation is completely voluntary. You want to do it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, there's no real pressure. Which is why most people have said, hey, it's not worth our time or money. Okay? I'm sure the top tier ones will get accredited and proudly display it, as I'm sure they're doing. Right? If you go to Fortis or Apollo, I would be surprised if they didn't display their accreditations and certificates on every little prescription and whatnot. But a vast majority don't believe in this, don't want it, are not getting accredited, okay? Large number of hospitals maintain more and more. And even the accreditation standards, these guys, NABS and ABL, they're looking for physical physical uh, characteristics, right? Do you have enough space for an ICU? Is there this much space between two beds? Do you have this many toilets for this many beds? Which has got very little to do with actual quality of medical care. It's to more to do with infrastructure and how a hospital is set up. And I wouldn't use that to equate that your surgery will be done well or the right surgery will be performed on you. Okay? Those are not covered by these quality. That's, that's how many, uh, what fraction of Indian labs have any kind of accreditation. Okay? So when you send your blood to this lab or that lab, how do you know whether your sugar value or your uh, uh, you know, malaria result is actually correct or valid, right? That's the question that's being asked here. So I, in fact, took the same person's blood and I quietly sent it off to five different labs in India. These are some of the biggest labs in India, okay? And I got very different results. So if I went by this this lab, this person is equivocal for TB. By the way, this is the banned TB test which shouldn't be done by any of these labs in the first place, okay? So if you ignore that for a second, None of these labs should be offering this test, but if you ignore that for a second, if I went into this lab, I would have gotten a positive result and gotten six months of TB treatment. If I went to this lab, I would have gone home with no TB treatment. Okay? System N of 1, I, I don't want you to take this more seriously than what it is, but who is actually checking on quality of labs is what I'm asking. Right? Is anyone sending dummy samples to them and say, let's see whether you come give me a right result or not? We are all like honest and faithful in the sense we trust whatever lab report is given to us. It never occurs to us that this lab report may be totally junk, right? Most patients have no way of judging any of this stuff, right? It's too much to put the burden on the patient to say, how do you judge the quality of a lab? It's just not possible to, to do that, right? Standardized guidelines. I can tell you with no doubts, there are plenty of guidelines, hundreds of guidelines. You just need to go online and look, okay? But it's, are they being used is the right question to ask, right? I've already told you TB, there's plenty of guidelines, they're just not being used. They're just not following guidelines because the incentives do not match what the guidelines ask them to do. So the guideline actually says no antibiotics required. How many practitioners say, yeah, sure, we won't prescribe an antibiotic, right? 
it's far easier to prescribe an antibiotic. Patient is happy, I get money back, whatever. And the incentives keep rolling along the same way. So if doctor's income depends on procedures, tests or interventions, then guidelines are not likely to be implemented. Because you're incentivized to do things that go against guidelines, right? So it's a very powerful force. No guideline is able to withstand the financial incentives and the motives that go along with it. And in the absence of any regulatory enforcement, who is actually checking that whether the guidelines are being followed or not? There's nobody who's writing to the doctor and saying, you've not been following this guideline. There's no feedback to them that they're not doing the right thing, right? They don't receive any kind of feedback from anyone whether they're doing the right thing or not. Retraining and certification. So I agree that medical education right from MBPS is important. But you know, until recently, no Indian doctor, including me, ever needed to get recertified or relicensed. So whatever I learned when I graduated, maybe the last thing I learned. After that, I have not gone and opened a book. I'm not kept up with the literature. I'm not going online to check what the recent guidelines that got published last week. I'm practicing whatever I learned when I graduated. In fact, research has shown that the most important predictor of your knowledge is the year you graduated. So if I graduated, and I did graduate in 1994, if I'm stuck in my 1994 knowledge, then the last 15 years worth of medical information has completely bypassed me, right? So it shouldn't be a shocker to you that I'm not up to date on the latest guideline. So only now, MCIC is all set to send doctors back to the lecture halls, failing which they would lose their license to practice. Okay? It's on paper, they're saying, you need to now go through continuing medical education, compulsory, without which you will not maintain the license. Now take a guess, do you think IMA will allow this to act to go through? No. Not a chance in hell. Do you think they'll, they'll agree to this? Forget it. In those 30 hours, I can see 35 patients and make money. But isn't that job being at least to a partial extent fulfilled by the uh, medical reps who are actually giving them some, okay, this is the latest what we have, this is what... And that is the biggest problem, right? How can you trust a medical rep who is out there to promote his or her product? The guidelines that medical reps give you are entirely skewed to say that that product is the best. It is not rocket science. Farmers, pharma rep are not there to disseminate knowledge, they are there to sell their product. It's a business, Shaker. They are out there with the best glossy brochures that their drug is better than their competitor's drug. Okay? All drugs may be irrational, but they will still say this is what I'm describing. Right? Okay? So it's actually sad that doctors have to rely on pharma, pharma reps for their knowledge of things. Right? That is just makes no sense to me at all. It's like, uh, you know, who, who is teaching you, right? The guy who wants to promote this product is teaching you. Okay, now let's come back to the issue of providers that you guys asked. Okay? Demand supply issue that we were raising about. So this is data from India on if you go to primary care providers, public, private and DBS, private trained, private untrained. Can you see this orange thing? Heck of a lot of untrained people are practicing medicine at the front line. When I say front line, in the community, in the village, in the urban slums, these people are often the first point of contact for a large number of poor patients. But whether they're under private and private, you are meaning only the, those who are practicing allopathy medicines or all other it's, all it's, a, it's all others, right? So there's Ayush practitioners. Oh, the medicines, then you cannot demand that they have the they need to have their own recertification, their own practice of medicine. But the problem with Ayush practitioners is not that they're practicing, they're fine. They're all licensed in their own fields. They do cross practice. Right? They go around giving steroids and allopathic medicines, which is very well documented. And then effectively, they manage everything the way modern NDBS is supposed to be doing. And the distinction between the two is rapidly blurred. Right? So, and they may do it for financial reasons. They may think that, look, if I don't give steroids, nobody's coming to me. So I'll start doing the same thing that an MBPS guy. They basically model their practice after the local MBPS doctors. Okay? They look at their MBPS prescriptions and they say, let me adopt the same kind of a prescription practice. And patients often can't tell. They just go thinking it's a doctor, patients may not even check. And these people, these people are called what? They're called RNPs. Right? There are different names for this, LNP, 
NPs, RMPs, it's a whole, and many of them are the only ones available in villages. On one hand, do we, uh, if you ask the IMA, these people are called quacks. IMA has an entire anti quackery cell. They hate these people, they think they're cutting into their business. They do not want to see quacks. Okay? So IMA is very clear, they have written guidelines on how to handle anti quackery. Okay? But these guys are often the only ones providing healthcare in the remote areas. So do we throw them out? Do we keep them? If we keep them, how do you retain somebody who's never been trained in the first place? Makes no sense, right? How do you recertify somebody when somebody who's not supposed to be practicing? It's just chaotic and, and this is the heterogeneity in our country. We just mentioned that India is too complicated. This is just a clear sign of how many different players are engaged in practicing, right? non allopathic unqualified people, MBBS, super specialists, it's all happening in one place. And it's very hard to know how do you retain all these cardio of people who are actually providing uh, care. So lastly, you all of you answered this question that I raised earlier. How can patients in India recognize quality and how can they be empowered to demand quality, right? This whole issue of demand creation or somehow, I, I have no idea, I'm just throwing these ideas as you are. Direct experience, right? All of you said, oh, I have a direct experience, good or bad, and that's how I make judgments. Word of mouth and referrals from trusted sources. Advertisements, you know? So and so performed a super heroic surgery and separated out two babies, right? And I said, wow, this guy must be a super duper surgeon, right? These sorts of news reports, advertise. You're not supposed to advertise, but you look at any paper, you will find the latest quarters, Apollo, all that sort of stuff there. Reputation of the hospital or institution. Do you guys see that I've seen banners in Bangalore saying that the number one ranked private specialty hospital by Times of India, whatever, right? By Week magazine. So there's some kind of a rating of quality. I don't know how they do it. But there is some kind of a rating that these people are using to advertise themselves. Doctor's qualification or training, judgments about uh, experience and seniority, and then of course perception that more expensive equals better quality. I can tell you already that this is a very, very dicey uh, assumption to make. Okay? You could, you could pay the highest amount of money for a surgery that should have never been done in the first place. I don't know how, how you equate that. Like, what kind of a quality metric is that? It, it shouldn't have been done in the first place and you paid heck of a lot of money for a procedure that shouldn't have been done. So I want to end by uh, sharing with you, this is the hospital that I trained, Christian Medical College in Vellore in India. You guys know Vellore is? Yes. It's not far from uh, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. So this is where I grew up, this is the hospital where I was born, this is where I did my medical training. And what is amazing, and I was there last week, what is amazing is, this hospital gets a huge number of patients from West Bengal. You believe? You get on a train, come all the way to South India, two days of train travel, right? And they come and they live in a hotel or lodge in the Lord, and they go to this hospital by the hundreds. So I asked myself, as I did all those years that I was training there, why on earth is this going on? Why do you think people come from one corner of the other to another to seek medical care? You think Calcutta has no doctors, no hospitals? What's the problem? Have you, have you, what, what, what can you explain this phenomenon? Brand name. Brand name. It's a brand name. You know, I honestly, I've asked a lot of people who work there as, as me. I think the unanimous, common, shared understanding is people come to this hospital not because they expect spectacular care or the best quality or the most affordable. I don't think that's why they are there. They are there for one reason. They think if they come to this place, their likelihood of getting ripped off is almost zero. Nobody in this hospital will get paid a cent more if they do more tests, less procedures, more procedure. Not one of them is incentivized to do anything other than what the standard protocol is. There's just zero scope that any doctor in this hospital will make even one rupee out of the patient. They cannot get money out of the patient. <coughs> Nobody can pay bribes. It's impossible in that structure. It's just rock solid built like that right from 100 years. Okay? 
It's never going to change. That's the way they are. So doctors in these hospitals are known for discouraging patients from getting more tests, from more drugs, from more surgery. Half the time is spent telling patients, you don't need this. Go home. Right? And I think that's just one factor that they won't get ripped off brings them on the way here. At the, at the end of it all, I have a cousin uh, here in Bangalore who is an ophthalmologist. He said to me, and it really resonates with me, he said, the best thing about being a doctor in India, Madhu, he said, that if something happens to you or your family, you can protect yourself from getting ripped off. That is really sad. If that's the biggest advantage of being a doctor in this country, it is really sad, but I have, that's exactly what he told me. There are people who tell you the same thing. So I'm not going to end by saying, I don't know how to solve this problem. Everything that I've said is factually true. It is of great significance to TB, but clearly it goes well beyond TB. There's nothing that I've said is unique to TB. TB is how I'm looking at it, but it's obviously a, a macro problem that, that whether it's TB or heart disease, it's the same thing. So any suggestion that any of you have, feel free to send me. I know we've run out of time. We've all been wonderful and patient and interactive. But I'm happy to take any questions or anything that you may have, any ideas that you can share, email it to me or share it with me after the seminar. I'm happy to, to listen to you. The advantage of coming to a group that I would normally not give this talk to an MBA group, because I would never come to an MBA or a management institution. But I've begun to think that the solution will probably lie outside of the medical sector. If you guys come up with some interesting business models or approaches, which is why I'm working with Shaker and Minel on TV, that people who are not in our field to come bring some new insights to how to run business models, how to creatively get the private sector engaged. I think innovative delivery side innovations are just dying to be done in this country. There was an Economist white paper published last year or this year. Uh, I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, it's called Healthcare Innovations in Asia. Okay, it's an Economist. Uh, white paper, and there's a whole section on India. There are interesting models from India. Are you guys aware of uh, these eye hospitals? Arunin Eye yeah. yeah. Care, um, the, the Devi Shetty uh, in Bangalore here uh, is held up as a model of innovation. There are some very interesting uh, stuff going on here. Uh, the uh, GE, that little uh, uh, cardiac portable, portable ECG, which costs very little. So there are medical device type of innovation is happening, but there are also interesting delivery innovations happening, right? How do you make good quality care affordable and still be profitable and financially viable? I think those sorts of models are fascinating and well worth the time. How many of you are interested in health as a management issue? A few? Okay, but I, I, I had the feeling after talking to Shekhar and Rinal that most of you are not really working in healthcare. You're more interested in selling cars or laptops or whatever it is that you sell, right? Right? So you're in, in you know standard corporate way of thinking. I'm not I'm not saying healthcare is, is uh, you know particularly interesting or sexy, but I think there are there is a definite need for professional managers in healthcare, people who can look at numbers, people who can think through business models. Because the traditional way of managing healthcare in India is a doctor and his wife, whichever way it is. Okay? So it's a family run, people and doctors are the last people who should be managing any business, to be honest. They don't know the first thing about how to handle money or how to come up with business models. Most of these small scale hospitals either close down or they don't, or they're not viable. Professional managers in health is a relatively new concept. Are they professional healthcare MBAs? There are no offered MBAs? No, there are uh, <coughs> healthcare management in uh, Jaipur. So there are some professional health management is a new breed of professionals coming in. But we also need professional managers for public health. How do you control TB? How do you control HIV? That should also be run in a very professional way, right? You want to think through all the options, business models. I think that's what we are lacking in TB. It's been run by doctors in a traditional, old-fashioned way. And they don't know the first thing about private sector, business model, financial, market-based approaches. So we need, we need some brand new uh, brains and thoughts into how to restructure our, our public health. So hopefully, at least some of you will take this up a little bit more seriously. Thank you very much.
Oh wow. <laughs> is this a kickback or? <laughs> I was actually spending time in your store looking at all your IMB t-shirts. <laughs>